horribly tedious parties they give, don't they? Oh, horribly tedious. Never know why I go. Never know why I go anywhere. Ah, uh, I come here to be educated. I hate being educated. <gasps> so do I. <laughs> it puts one almost on the level of the commercial classes, doesn't it? But then, dear Gertrude Children is always telling me that I should have some serious purpose in life. So I come here to try to find one. I don't see anyone here tonight who one could possibly call a serious purpose. The man who took me to dinner talked to me about his wife the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how very trivial of him. Terribly trivial. What did your man talk about? Oh, about myself. <laughs> and were you interested? Not in the smallest degree. <laughs> what martyrs we are, dear Margaret. And how well it becomes us, Olivia. <laughs> Lord Cavishaw. Uh, good evening, Lady Chilton. Has my good-for-nothing young son been here? I don't believe Lord Goring has arrived quite yet, Lord Cavishaw. Why do you call Lord Goring good-for-nothing? Ah, uh, because he leads such an idle life. How can you say such a thing? Why, he rides in the row at 10 o'clock in the morning, goes to the opera three times a week, changes his clothes at least five times a day, and dines out every night of the season. You don't call that leading an idle life, do you? You are a very charming young lady. <laughs> How sweet of you to say that, Lord Caversham. Do come to us more often. You know we are always at home on Wednesdays, and you look so well with your star. Never go anywhere now. I'm sick of London society. I shouldn't mind being introduced to my own tailor. He always votes on the right side. But object strongly to being sent down to dinner with my wife's milliner. Never could stand Lady Caversham's bonnet. <laughs> oh, I love London society. I think it is immensely improved. It is entirely composed now of beautiful idiots and brilliant lunatics. <laughs> Just what society should be. Oh. And which is Goring? Beautiful idiot or the other thing? I have been obliged for the present to put Lord Goring into a class quite by himself. But he is developing charmingly. Into what? I hope to let you know very soon, Lord Cavendish. <laughs> Lady Murphy, Mrs. Chidley. <laughs> So good of you to let me bring my friend, Mrs. Cheveley. Two such charming women should know each other. Uh, I believe Mrs. Cheveley and I have met before. I did not know she had married a second time. Oh, um, nowadays people marry as often as they can, don't they? <laughs> 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 oh, dear, that's the but have we really met before, Lady Children? I can't remember where I've been out of the country for so long. Oh, why, we were in school together, Mrs. Cheveley. Really? I've forgotten all about my school days. I have a vague impression they were detestable. <laughs> I'm not at all surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Dear my lady children, I'm so looking forward to meeting your clever husband. Since he's been in the foreign office, he's been so much talked of in Vienna. They actually succeeded in spelling his name right in the newspapers. That would sell his fame on the continent. <laughs> well, I hardly believe there'll be much in common between yourself and my husband, Mrs. Cheveley. Oh, uh, yeah, madame, get us all, please. I have not seen you since my leave. No. <laughs> Five years ago. And you are younger and more beautiful than ever. <laughs> How do you manage it? By making it a rule only to talk with perfectly charming people, such as yourself. Ah, you flatter me. You flatter me, as they say here. Do they say that here? How dreadful of you. Easy, Lady Barbie. I hope you have brought Sir John with you. Oh, I have brought a much more charming person than Sir John. Sir John's temper, since he has taken seriously to politics, has become quite unbearable. Really, now that the House of Commons is trying to become useful, it does a great deal of harm. I hope not. <laughs> At any rate, we do our best to waste the public time, don't we? But who is this most charming person you've been so kind to bring to us? Her name is Mrs. Cheveley. One of the Dorsets of Cheveleys, I suppose, that I really don't know. Families are so mixed in our days, indeed, as a rule. Everybody turns out to be somebody else. <laughs> Mrs. Cheveley, I seem to know that name. She has just arrived in Vienna. Ah, yes, I think I know whom you mean. She goes everywhere there and has such pleasant scandals about all her friends. <laughs> I really must go to Vienna next winter. I hope they have a good chef at the embassy. If there is not, the ambassador will certainly have to be recalled. Pray, <laughs> point out Mrs. Cheveley to me. I should like to see her. Let me introduce you. My dear, Sir Robert Chilton is dying to know you. Everyone is dying to know the brilliant Mrs. Cheveley. Our tasse is in Vienna writes of nothing else. Thanks, Mr. Bowden. begins with a compliment is sure to develop into a real friendship. It begins in the right manner. And I find that I know Lady 
children already. Really? Yes. She has just reminded me they're at school together. I remember it perfectly now. She always got the good conduct prize. I have a distinct recollection of Lady Chiltern always getting the good conduct prize. And what prizes did you get? <laughs> My prizes came a little later on in life. I don't think any of them were for good behavior. Yes. Uh, I'm sure they were for something charming. I don't know the women are usually rewarded for being charming. I think they're usually punished for it. Certainly more women grow old nowadays through the faithfulness of their admirers than through anything else. At least that is the only way I can account for the terribly haggard look of most of your pretty women here in London. What an appalling philosophy that sounds. To attempt to classify you, Mrs. Cheveley, would be an impertinence. But may I ask, at heart, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Those seem to be the only two fashionable religions left to us nowadays. Oh, I have neither. Optimism begins in a broad grin, and pessimism ends in blue spectacles. Besides, they are both of them merely poses. You prefer the natural? Sometimes, but it is such a difficult pose to keep up. What would those modern psychological novelists, of whom we hear so much, say to such a thing as that? Oh, the strength of women comes from the fact that psychology cannot explain us. <laughs> Science cannot grapple with the problem of women. Science can never grapple with the problem of the irrational. That is why it has no future before it, in this world. And women represent the irrational. Well-dressed women do. <laughs> I fear I can hardly agree with you there. But do sit down. And now tell me, what makes you leave your brilliant Vienna or gloomy London? Or perhaps the question is indiscreet. Questions are never indiscreet. Answers sometimes are. <laughs> Well, may I know uh, whether it's for politics or pleasure? Oh, politics are my only pleasure. You see, nowadays it's not fashionable to flirt till one is 40, or be romantic till one is 45. So we poor women who are under 30, or say we are, have nothing left to suggest politics or philanthropy. And philanthropy seems to me to be simply the refuge for those people who wish to annoy their fellow creatures. <laughs> I prefer politics. I think they are more becoming. A political life is a noble career. Sometimes. And sometimes it's a clever game, Sir Robert. And sometimes it's a great nuisance. Oh, which do you find it? I. A combination of all three. Allow me. Thanks. But you have not yet told me. What makes you visit London so suddenly? Our season is nearly over. Oh, I don't care for the London season. It's too matrimonial. People are either hunting for husbands or hiding from them. <laughs> I really came to see you. It's quite true. You know what a woman's curiosity is. Almost as great as a man's. I wanted very much to meet you and to ask you to do something for me. I hope it is not a little thing, Mr. Chibi. I do find little things so very difficult to do. No, I don't think it is quite a little thing. I'm so glad. Do tell me what it is. Uh, later on. And now may I walk through your beautiful house? I hear your pictures are charming. Poor Baron Arnheim. You remember the Baron? He used to say you had some wonderful corrodes. <coughs> Did you know the Baron well? Intimately. Did you? Yes, at one time. Wonderful man, wasn't he? He was very remarkable in many ways. I have thought it's such a pity he never wrote his memoirs. They would have been most <coughs> interesting. He knew men and cities well, like the old Greek. Without the dreadful disadvantage of having a Penelope waiting at home for him. <laughs> Lord Gore. Good evening, dear Arthur. Mrs. Jeevely. Allow me to introduce to you Lord Goring, the idlest man in London. I have met Lord Goring before. Uh, Mrs. Cheveley, I did not think I, you would remember me. My memory is under admirable control. Are you still a bachelor? I believe so. <laughs> How very romantic. No, I am not at all romantic. I am not old enough. I leave romance to my seniors. <laughs> Lord Goring is a result of the Boodles Club, Mrs. Cheveley. He reflects every credit on that institution. <laughs> May I ask, are, are you staying in London long? That depends partly on the weather, partly on the cooking, and partly on Sir Robert. You are not planning on plunging us into a European war, I hope. There is no danger of that. At present. <laughs> <laughs> we were very late. Have you missed me? Awfully. Then I'm sorry I didn't stay away longer. I like being missed. <laughs> <laughs> How very selfish of you. I am very selfish. <laughs> Bad qualities, Lord Goring. And I've only told you half of them as yet, Miss Mabel. Are the others very bad? Quite dreadful. When I think of them at night, 
I go to sleep at once. <laughs> well, I'd lie to your bad qualities. I wouldn't have you part with one of them. No, how very nice of you, but then you are always nice. By the way, I, I want to ask you a question, Miss Mabel. Who brought Mrs. Cheatley here? That, that woman in heliotrope has just got out of the room with your brother. Oh, Lady Markby brought her, I think. Why do you ask? I haven't seen her for years, so that's all. What an absurd reason. Oh, all reasons are absurd. What sort of a woman is she? Mm. A genius in the daytime and a beauty at night. I dislike her already. That shows her admirable good taste. Ah, oh, the English young ladies, quite the drago of good taste. Is she not? Quite the drago of good taste. Uh, so the newspapers are always telling us. Oh, I read all your English newspapers. I find them so amusing. <laughs> then, my dear little non talk you must certainly read between the lines. I should like to watch my professor Chips. May I have the pleasure of escorting you to the uh, music room, mademoiselle? <laughs> delighted, Vicomte. Quite delighted. Aren't you coming to the music room? Not if there's any music going on, Miss Mabel. German. You would not understand it. Well, sir, what are you doing here? Wasting your life as usual, I suppose? You should be in bed, sir. You keep too late hours. Why, I heard of you the other night at Lady Rufford's dancing till four o'clock in the morning. Only a course for father. Can't make out how you stand London society. The whole thing has gone to the dogs. Well, nobody's talking about it. Nothing. I love talking about nothing, Father. It's the only thing I know anything about. <laughs> Seems to me to be living entirely for pleasure. What else is there to live for, Father? Nothing ages like happiness. You are heartless, sir. Very heartless. Why oh, hope not. Good evening, Lady Basildon. Are you here? I had no idea you ever came to political parties. I adore political parties. They're the only place left to us where people don't talk politics. <laughs> I delight in talking politics. I talk them all day long, but I can't bear listening to them. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how the unfortunate men in the house stand these long debates. By never listening. <gasps> really? Of course. You see, if one listens, one may be convinced. And a man who allows himself to be convinced by an argument is a thoroughly unreasonable person. That counts for so much in men that I have never understood, and so much in women that their husbands never appreciate in them. Oh, our husbands never appreciate anything in us. We have to go to others for that. Yes, always to others. We not. And those are the views of the two ladies known to have the most admirable husbands in London. That is precisely what we cannot stand. My Reginald is quite hopelessly faultless indeed. He is unendurably so at times. There is not the smallest element of excitement in knowing him. How terrible, really. The thing should be more widely known. Basildon is quite as bad. He's as domestic as if he were a bachelor. My poor Olivia. We married perfect husbands and we are well punished for it. <laughs> I should have thought it was the husbands who were punished. <laughs> oh dear, no. They are as happy as possible. And as for trusting us, it is tragic how they trust us. Perfectly tragic. Or comic, Lady Basildon? Uh, certainly not comic, Lord Goring. How kind of you to suggest such a thing. Lord Goring is in the camp of the enemy, as usual. I saw him talking to Mrs. Cheatley when we came in. The handsome woman, Mrs. Cheatley. Please do not praise other women in our presence. Only for us to do that. I did wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are not going to wait. She's quite right, too. The women are all dandies, and the men are all dowdies, aren't they? Oh, do you really think that that's what Mrs. Cheatley meant? Of, of course, and, and quite a sensible remark for Mrs. Cheatley to make, too. Why are you talking about Mrs. Cheatley? Everybody's talking about Mrs. Cheatley. Lord Goring says... What did you say, Lord Goring, about Mrs. Cheatley? Oh, I remember that she was a genius in the daytime and a beauty at night. Oh, what a horrid combination. <laughs> 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 I like looking at geniuses and listening to beautiful people. That is morbid of you, Mrs. Marchmont. Morbid! I am so glad that you say that, Lord Boring. Marchmont and I have been married seven years, and he never once noticed that I am morbid. That is so terribly absurd. 
<laughs> I've always said, dear Margaret, that you were the most morbid person in London. <laughs> that you were always so sympathetic, dear Olivia. Is it morbid to have a desire for food? I have a great desire for food. Lord Gordon, will you give me some supper? With pleasure. How horrid you have been. You have never talked to me the whole evening. How could I? You went away with the child diplomat. <laughs> I like you immensely. <laughs> I wish you'd show it in a more marked way. <laughs> oh, my dear Olivia, I feel absolutely faint. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> oh, I think I should like some supper. I know I should like some supper. Oh, I am positively dying for supper, Margaret. And it's so horribly selfish that you ever think of these things. And I'm grossly material. <laughs> grossly material. <laughs>
And then I want you to say a few words to the effect that the government is going to reconsider the question, and you have reason to believe the canal, if completed, will be of great international value. Will you do that for me? Mrs. Cheveley, you cannot be serious in making me such a proposition. I'm quite serious. Pray allow me to believe that you are not. Oh, but I am. And if you do what I ask, I will pay you very handsomely. Pay me? Yes. I fear I don't quite understand what you mean. How very disappointing. And I have come all the way from Vienna in order that you should thoroughly understand me. I fear I don't. Sir Robert, you are a man of the world, and you have your price, I suppose. Everybody has nowadays. The only disadvantage is everyone is so dreadfully expensive. I know I am. I hope you'll be more reasonable in your terms. If you will allow me, I will call your carriage for you. You have been abroad so long, Mrs. Cheeley that you seem unable to realize that you are speaking to an English gentleman. I realize that I am talking to a man who laid the foundations of his fortune by selling to a stock exchange speculator, a cabinet secret. What do you mean? I mean that I know the real origin of your wealth and your career, and I've got your letter, too. What letter? The letter you wrote to Baron Arnheim when you were Lord Bradley's secretary, telling the Baron to buy Suez Canal shares, a letter written three days before the government announced its own purchase. It is not true. You thought the letter had been destroyed. How foolish of you. It is in my possession. The affair to which you allude was no more than a speculation. The House of Commons had yet not yet passed the bill. It might have been rejected. It was a swindle, Sir Robert. Let us call things by their proper names. It makes everything simpler. And now I'm going to sell you that letter. And the price I ask for it is your public support of the Argentine Canal Scheme. You made your own fortune out of one canal. You must help my friends and me make our fortunes out of another. It is infamous what you propose. Infamous! Oh, no. This is the game of life, as we all must play it, Sir Robert. Sooner or later. I cannot do what you ask. You mean you cannot help <laughs> doing it. You are standing on the edge of a precipice, and it is not for you to make terms. It is for you to accept them. Besides, supposing you refuse... What then? My dear Sir Robert, what then? You are ruined, that is all. Scandals used to lend charm, or at least interest to a man. Now they crush him, and yours is a very nasty scandal. You couldn't survive it. If it were known that as a young man's secretary to a great and important minister, you sold a cabinet secret for a large sum of money, and that that was the origin of your wealth and your position, you would be hounded out of public life. You would disappear completely. And besides, why should you sacrifice your entire future rather than deal diplomatically with your enemy? For the moment, I am your enemy. I admit it. And I am much stronger than you are. The big battalions are all on my side. You have your splendid position, but it's your splendid position which makes you so vulnerable. You can't defend it. And I am in the attack. But you must admit, I have not talked morality to you. In all fairness, I have spared you that. Years ago, you did a clever, unscrupulous thing. It turned out a great success. You owe to it your wealth and career. Now, you've got to pay for it. Sooner or later, we all must pay for what we do. You've got to pay now. Before I leave you tonight, you must promise to suppress your report and speak in the house in favor of this scheme. What you ask is impossible. You must make it possible. You are going to make it possible. Sir Robert, do you know what your English newspapers are like? Supposing when I leave here tonight, I drive down to one of their offices and give them this scandal and the proofs of it. Think of their loathsome joy in dragging you down into the mud and mire they would plunge you. Think of the hypocrite with his greasy smile penning the leading article and arranging the thumbs. Stop! You want me to withdraw the report and make a short speech stating that I believe there are possibilities in the scheme. Those? On my terms. I'll give you any sum of money you want. <laughs> Even you are not rich enough to buy back your past, Sir Robert. No man is. I will not do what you ask. I will not. You've got to. If you do not. Wait a moment. What did you propose? You said that you would give me back my letter, didn't you? Yes, that was agreed. I'll be in the ladies' gallery at half past eleven tomorrow night. If by that time, and you will have had heaps of opportunity, you have made a speech to the house in the terms I wish, I will give you your letter with the prettiest thanks and the best. 
or at any rate, the most suitable compliment I can think of. I intend to play quite fairly with you. One should always play fairly when one has the winning cards. The Baron taught me that, among other things. You must give me time to consider your proposal. No, you've got to settle now. Give me a week. Three days. It's impossible. I go to telegraph Vienna tonight. <clears throat> what brought you into my life? Circumstances. Don't go. I consent. I will have the report withdrawn. And a question placed me on the subject. Thank you, Sir Robert. I knew we should come to an amicable agreement. I understood your nature from the first. I analyzed you, though you did not adore me. And now, will you fetch my carriage for me? I see the people coming up after supper. And an Englishman always gets romantic after a meal, and that bores me dreadfully. <laughs> well, dear Mrs. Cheveley, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. Sir Robert is very entertaining, is he not? Most entertaining. I've enjoyed my talk with him immensely. He's had a most admirable and brilliant career, and he's married an excellent wife. Lady Chilton is a woman of the very highest principle, I'm glad to say. I'm a bit too old now myself to trouble about setting a good example, but I always admire people who do. <laughs> Lady Chilton has a very ennobling effect on life, though her dinner parties are a bit dull at times, but one can't have everything, can one? And I really must go, dear. Shall I call for you tomorrow? Thanks. We might join in the park at five. Everything is so fresh in the park now. Except the people. Perhaps the people are a bit jaded. I've often observed that the season as it goes on produces a kind of softening of the brain. However, anything is better than high intellectual pressure. That is the most unbecoming thing there is. <laughs> it makes the noses of the young girls so particularly large, and there's nothing so difficult to marry as a large nose. I do not like them. Good night, dear. Good night, Gertrude. What a charming house you have, Lady Children. I spent a most delightful evening. It was so interesting getting to know your husband. Oh, and why did you wish to know my husband, Mrs. G? Oh, I will tell you. I wanted to interest him in the Argentine canal scheme, of which I dare say you have heard, and I found him most susceptible. A susceptible to reason, that is. A rare thing in a man. I converted him in ten minutes. He's going to make a speech tomorrow night in favor of the scheme. We must go to the ladies' gallery and hear him. It will be a great occasion. There must be some mistake. Why, that scheme would never have my husband's support. Oh, I assure you, it's all settled. I don't regret my tedious journey from Vienna now. It's been a great success. But of course, for the next 24 hours, the whole thing is a dead secret. A secret? Between who? Between your husband and myself. Your carriage, Mrs. Cheveley. Uh, thanks, Sir Robert. Good night, lady children. <laughs> Good night, Lord Goring. I'm Sadie Claridge's. Don't you think you might leave a card? If you wish it. Oh, don't be so serious. Don't you be obliged to leave a card on you? And I don't suppose that's going to be on the other here. Abroad, we'll be more civilized. Will you show me now, Sir Robert? Now that we have the same interests at heart, we'll be great friends. I hope. <laughs> What a horrid woman! You should go to bed, Miss Mabel. Why, Gordon? My father told me to go to bed an hour ago. I don't see why I shouldn't give you the same advice. I always pass on good advice. It's the only thing to do with it. Never of any use to oneself. Lord Gordon, you are always ordering me out of the room. I think it most courageous of you, especially as I am not going to bed for hours. You can come and sit down if you like and talk about anything in the world. novels in Scotch dialect. They are not improving subjects. What is this? Someone has dropped a diamond brooch. Quite beautiful, isn't it? I wish it was mine, but Gertrude won't let me wear anything but pearls. <coughs> and I am thoroughly sick of pearls. They make one look so plain, so good, and so intellectual. <laughs> I wonder who the brooch belongs to. I, I wonder who dropped it. It is a beautiful brooch. It, it is a handsome bracelet. It isn't a bracelet, it's a brooch. What? It could be used as a bracelet. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, Miss Mabel, I'm going to make a, a rather strange request of you. Oh, pray do. I've been waiting for it all the evening. <laughs>
Don't mention to anybody that I've taken charge of this brooch. Should anyone write and claim it, uh, let me know at once. That is a strange request. Well, you see, it, I gave this brooch to someone years ago. You did? Uh, yes. Then I shall certainly bid you good night. <laughs> good night, Richard. <laughs> You saw whom they might be brought here tonight. Uh, yes, it, it was an unpleasant surprise. What did she come here for? Apparently to try to lure Robert into upholding some fraudulent scheme in which she's interested. Why, the Argentine Canal, in fact. She's certainly mistaken her man, hasn't she? She's incapable of understanding an upright nature like my husband's. Uh, I should fancy she came to grief if she tried to get Robert into our toils. It's extraordinary what astounding mistakes clever women make. Uh, I don't call women of that kind clever. I call them stupid. Same thing often. <laughs> Good night. My dear Arthur, you are not leaving. Do stop a little. No, I'm afraid I can't. Uh, thanks. I, I promised to look into the hot marks tonight. I, I believe they have a Moabagarian band playing Moabagarian music. But I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> How beautiful you look tonight, Gertrude. Robert, it, it is not true, is it? You're not going to uphold this Argentine speculation. You couldn't. Who, who, who told you I intended to do so? That woman, Mrs. Cheevey, has just gone out. She seemed to talk me with it. Robert, I know this woman. You don't. We were at school together. She was evil, dishonest, an evil influence on every person whose trust or friendship she could win. I hated, I despised her. She was a thief. She stole things. She was sent away for being a thief. Robert, why do you let her influence you? Gertrude, what you say may be true. But it happened many years ago. It is best forgotten. Mrs. Cheveley may have changed since then. One should not be entirely judged by their past. But one's past is what one is. Why, it is the only way by which any person should be judged. That is a hard saying, Gertrude. It is a true saying, Robert. And what did she mean by saying she had gotten you to lend your support, your name, to the very thing I've heard you describe as, as the most dishonest and fraudulent scheme there's ever been in political life? I was mistaken in the view I took. We all make mistakes. But you told me yesterday that you had received the report from the commission, and that it entirely condemned the whole thing. I have reason <coughs> now to believe that the commission was prejudiced, or at any rate misinformed. Besides, Gertrude, public life and private life are different things. They have different laws and move on different lines. But they should both represent man at his highest. Why, I see no difference between them. In a matter of practical politics, I have changed my mind. That is all. All? Yes! Robert! Oh, it's horrible I should even have to ask you such a question. Robert, are you telling me the whole truth? Why do you ask me such a question? Why do you not answer it? Uh, Gertrude, truth is a very complex thing. And, and politics is a very complex business. There are wheels with <laughs> wheels. One may be under certain obligations to others that one must pay. Sooner or later in political life, one has to compromise. Everyone does. Compromise? Robert, why do you talk so differently tonight than the way I've always heard you talk? Why are you changed? I am not changed. But circumstances alter things. Circumstances should never alter your principles. But if I told you... What? That it was necessary, vitally necessary. Robert, it can never be necessary to do that which is not honest. Or if it be necessary, what is it that I have loved? But it is not. Robert, tell me it is not. What would you gain by it? Money? Well, we have no need of that. And money that comes from a tainted source is a degradation. Power? But power is nothing in itself. It is the power to do good that is fine, that and that only. Well, what is it then? Robert, tell me why you're going to do this, this dishonest thing. Gertrude, you have no right to use that word. I told you it was a question of rational compromise. It is no more than that. Robert, that is all very well for other men. Men who treat life simply as a sordid speculation. But not for you, Robert. Not for you. You are different. All your life you have stood apart from others. You have never let the world soil you. Why, to the whole world, as to myself, you've been an ideal always. 
Be that ideal still, that great inheritance thrown not away, that tower of ivory do not destroy. Robert, men can love things beneath them, things stained, unworthy, dishonored. But we women worship when we love. And when we lose our worship, we've lost everything. Don't kill my love for you. Robert, don't kill that. Gertrude! I, I know there are some men with horrible secrets in their lives. The men who have done some act of shame and in some critical moment have to pay for it by doing another act of shame. Oh, don't tell me you're such as they are, Robert. Robert, is there in your life any secret dishonor or disgrace? You must tell me. Tell me at once. Tell me that... That, that what? That our lives may drift apart. Drift apart? That they may be entirely separate. It would be better for us both. Gertrude, there is nothing in my past life that you might not know. I was sure of it, Robert. I was sure of it. Why did you say those dreadful things, things so unlike yourself? Don't ever let us talk about the subject again. You will write, won't you, to Mrs. Cheveley and tell her that you cannot uphold this scandalous scheme of hers? And if you have given her any promise, you must take it back. That is all. I must I write and tell her that? Why, surely. What else is there to do? I could go and see her personally. It would be better. No. She's not a woman you should ever speak to. She is not worthy to talk to a man like you. No, you must write it now, once this moment. And let your letter show her that your decision is quite irrevocable. Right this moment. Why, yes. It's so late. It's nearly twelve. That makes no matter. She must know at once that she's been mistaken in you. And that you are not a man to do anything base or underhand or dishonorable. Right here, Robert. Write that you decline to support this scheme of hers as you hold it to be a dishonest one. And yes, even write the word dishonest. She knows what that word means. Yes, that will do. And now for the envelope. always, Gertrude. Love me always. I will love you always, because you will always be worthy of love. And we must love the highest when we see it. Put out the lights, Mason! Put out the lights. Love within me. 
The last night would have been quite impossible. She would have turned from me in horror, in horror and in contempt. Is Lady Chiltern as, as perfect as all that? Yes, my wife is as perfect as all that. What's a pity? <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite mean it like that. But, but if what you tell me is true, I should like to have a serious talk about life with Lady Chiltern. <laughs> Would be quite useless. May I try? Yes, but nothing could alter her views. Well, at the worst, it would simply be a, a psychological experiment. <laughs> All such experiments are terribly dangerous. Everything is dangerous, my dear fellow. If life wasn't so, it wouldn't be worth living. <laughs> well, I'm bound to say that I think you should have told her years ago. When? When we were engaged? Do you think that she would have married me if she had known that the origin of my fortune was such as it is? The basis of my career, such as it is, and that I have done a thing that I suppose most men would call shameful and dishonorable. Yes, yes, most men would call it ugly names. There's no doubt about that. Men who every day do something of the same kind themselves. Men who each one of them have worse secrets in their own lives. That is the reason why they're so pleased to find out other people's secrets. It distracts public attention from their own. Uh, and after all, who did I wrong by what I did? No one. Except yourself, Robert. Of course, I had private information about a certain transaction contemplated by the government of the day, and I acted on it. Private information is practically the source of every large modern fortune, a public scandal invariably the result. <laughs> Do you really think, Arthur, that what I did nearly 18 years ago should be brought up against me now? Do you think it fair that a man's whole career should be ruined by an act done in one's boyhood almost? I was 22 at the time, and I had the double misfortune of being well-born and poor. Two unforgivable things nowadays. Is it fair <coughs> that the folly, the sin of one's youth, that men should choose to call it a sin, should wreck a life like mine, should place me in the pillory, should shatter all that I have worked for, all that I have built up, is it fair, Arthur? Life is never fair, Robert. And perhaps it is a good thing for most of us that it is not. Every man of ambition has to fight his age with its own weapons. What this century worships is wealth. The god of this century is wealth. To succeed, one must have wealth. At all costs, one must have wealth. You underrate yourself, Robert. Without wealth, you could have succeeded just as well. When I was old, perhaps, when I had lost my passion for power, but could not use it, when I was tired, worn out, disappointed. I went to success when I was young. Youth is the time for success. I couldn't wait. No one has had such a brilliant success such as yours. But under Secretary of Foreign Affairs at, at the age of 40? But that's good enough for anyone, I should suppose. And if it is all taken away from me now, if I lose everything over some horrible scandal, if I am driven from public life. Robert, how could you have sold yourself for money? I did not sell myself for money. I bought success at a great price. That is all. Yes, yes, you certainly paid a great price for it. But, but what made you first think of doing such a thing? Baron Arnheim. A scoundrel? No. He was a man of most subtle and refined intellect. A man of culture, charm, and distinction. He was one of the most intellectual men I have ever met. Oh, I prefer a gentlemanly fool any day. There's more to be said for stupidity than people imagine. Personally, I have great admiration for stupidity. It's sort of a fellow feeling, I suppose. <laughs> but, but how did he do it? Tell me the entire thing. One night, after dinner at Lord Radley's, the Baron began talking about success in modern life, as if it could be reduced to an absolutely definite science. With that wonderfully fascinating quiet voice of his, he expounded to us the most terrible of all philosophies, the philosophy of power, preached to us the most marvelous of all gospels, the gospel of gold. He must have seen the effect he had produced upon me, for some days later, he wrote and asked me to come and see him. He was living then in Park Lane, in the house Lord Wolcombe has now. I can still remember how with a strange smile and some pale curved lips, he led me to his wonderful picture galleries, 
showed me his tapestries, his carved ivories, his enamels, and his jewelry. It made me wonder at the strange loveliness and the luxury in which he lived. And then told me that that luxury was nothing but a background, a painted scene in a play. And that power, power over others, power over the world, is the one thing worth having, the one supreme pleasure worth knowing, the one joy one never tired of. And that in this century, only the rich possessed it. A thoroughly shallow creed. I didn't think so then. I don't think so now. Wealth has given me enormous power. It gave me at the outset freedom. And freedom is everything. You have never known what it means to be poor. Never known what ambition is. You could not understand what a chance the Baron gave me. Such a chance as few men get. Fortunately for them, if one is to judge by results. But, but tell me, Captain Lee, how did he finally persuade you to, to, well, to do what you did? When I was leaving, he told me that if I could ever give him any private information of real value, he would make me a very rich man. I was dazed at the prospects he held out to me. My ambition and desire for power were at that time boundless. Six weeks later, certain private documents passed through my hands. State documents? Yes. I had no idea that, that you, of all the men in the world, could have been so weak, Robert, as to yield to such a temptation as Baron Arnheim held out to you. Weak? Do you really think, Arthur, that it is weakness that yields to temptation? I tell you, there are terrible temptations, that it takes strength, strength and courage to yield to, to stake all of one's life on a single moment, to risk everything on one throw, whether for power or pleasure, I care not. There is no weakness in that. There is a horrible, a terrible courage, and I had that courage. I sat down the very same afternoon and wrote Baron Arnheim the ledger this woman now holds. And the Baron made three quarters of a million off the transaction. And you? I received from the Baron 110,000 pounds. You were worth more, Robert. And no, that money gave me exactly what I wanted. Power over others. I went into the house immediately. The Baron advised me in finances from time to time. And before five years, I had nearly trebled my fortune. Since then, everything I have touched has turned out a success. I have had a luck so extraordinary in everything connected with finances that sometimes it has made me almost afraid. I remember reading somewhere, in some strange book, that when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. But you didn't never feel any remorse, any regret for what you had done? No. I felt that I had fought my age with its own weapons, and won. You thought you had won? I, I thought so. Arthur, do you despise me for what I have told you? I'm very sorry for you, Robert. Very sorry indeed. I don't say that I had any remorse. I didn't. Not remorse in the ordinary, rather silly sense of the word. But I have paid conscience money many times. I had a hope that I might disarm destiny. The sum that the Baron gave me, I have given twice over to public charities since then. In public charities? Dear me, what a lot of harm you must have done, Robert. Don't say that! <laughs> I don't talk like that! Never mind what I say. I'm always saying what I shouldn't say. In fact, I usually say what I really think. A great mistake nowadays. It makes one so liable to be misunderstood. As regards this dreadful affair, I'll help you in any way that I can. Of course you know that. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. But what is to be done? What can be done? Well, the English can't stand a man who's always saying that he's in the right. But they are very fond of a man who admits to being in the wrong. It's one of the best things in them. However, in your case, a, a confession would not do. The money, the money, if you allow me to say so, is, is awkward. <laughs> no, if you did make a clean breast of the whole affair, you'd never be able to talk morality again. And 
in England, a man who can't talk morality twice a week to a large, popular, moral audience is quite over a serious politician. <laughs> There'd be nothing left for him. Nothing left for him as an occupation except for, for botany. Botany or the, the church. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, a confession would not do. It would ruin you. It would ruin me. Arthur, it seems that the only thing left for me to do now is to, to fight the thing out. I've been waiting for you to say that. And you must first begin by telling your wife the entire thing. That I will not do. Robert, you are wrong. It would kill her love for me. And now, for this woman, Mrs. Cheapy. How can I defend myself against her? You knew her before, Arthur, apparently. Yes. <laughs> well, did you know her well? So little that I was engaged to be married to her when I was staying at the Timbys. The affair lasted three days. <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> Why was it broken off? Oh, I can't remember. At least it makes no matter. By the way, if you tried her with the with money, she used to be confoundedly fond of money. <laughs> I offered her any sum of money she wanted. She refused. Then the marvelous gospel of gold breaks out sometimes. The rich can't do everything. <laughs> Not everything. I suppose you are right. Arthur, I feel that public disgrace is in store for me. I feel certain of it. I have never known what terror was before. I know it now. It, it is as if a hand of ice were placed upon one's heart. As if one's heart were beating itself to death in some empty hollow. You must fight her, Robert! You must fight her! But how? I don't know. I can't, I don't know, I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> but there is weakness in each one of us. There are, there is flaws in each one of us. My father tells me even I have faults. <laughs> Perhaps I have. I don't know. <laughs> I have the right to use any weapon I can find, have I not? In your place, I wouldn't have the smallest scruple in doing so. She is thoroughly well able to take care of herself. Well, I shall send a telegram to the embassy at Vienna to inquire if there is anything known against her. There might be some secret scandal she might be afraid of. Oh, I should fancy Mrs. Chiefly one of those very modern women who find scandals becoming a new bonnet and air them every afternoon in the park at 5.30. I'm sure she adores scandal and that the, the sorrow in her life is that she can't manage to have enough of them. <laughs> Why do you say that? Uh, she wore far too much rouge last night and uh, not quite enough clothes. It's always a sign of despair in a woman. <laughs> but it is worth my while writing to Vienna, is it not? It's always worthwhile asking a question, although it's uh, not always worthwhile answering one. Is Mr. Trafford in this room? Yes, Sir Robert. Tell him to have this sent off in a cipher at once. There must not be a moment's delay. Yes, Sir Robert. Oh, give that back a moment. <coughs> Mrs. Cheveley must have had some curious hold over the Baron. I wonder what it was. I wonder. <laughs> As long as my wife knows nothing, I will fight her to the death. No, fight in any case. In any case. If my wife found out, there would be little left to fight for. Well, as soon as I hear back from Vienna, I will let you know the results. It is a chance, just a chance. But I believe in it. Just as I have fought my age with its own weapons, I will fight her with her own weapons. Besides, she looks like a woman with a past, doesn't she? Uh, most pretty women do. <laughs> but there is a fashion in past, just as there is a fashion in frocks. And perhaps Mrs. Cheveley's past is merely a slightly decollete uh, one, and, and they are excessively popular nowadays. Besides, I should not put too high hopes of uh, frightening Mrs. Cheveley. Uh, should not fancy Mrs. Cheveley a woman to be easily frightened. She survived all her creditors, and she shows wonderful presence of mind. <laughs> oh, I live on hopes now. I clutch at every chance. I'm like a man on a ship that is sinking. The water is around my feet. The very night air is bitter with storm. Robert! Hush! I hear my wife's voice. 
Good afternoon, Lord Gord. Uh, good afternoon, Lady Chiltern. Have you been in the park? No, I've just come from the Women's Liberal Association, where, by the way, Robert, your name was received with loud applause, and I come in to have my tea. Oh, you must stay for tea, won't you? Uh, for a short time, thanks. Well, I'll be back in a moment. I'm only going to take off my bonnet. Uh, don't, please don't. It's, it's such a lovely hat. One of, one of the loveliest hats I've ever seen. I hope the Women's Liberal Association received it with a lot of applause. <laughs> we have much more important work to do than look at each other's bonnets, Lord Gordon. <laughs> really? <laughs> No, Lady Chiltern, I am not a pessimist. In fact, I, 
I don't quite know what pessimism really means. <laughs> All I do know is that life cannot be understood without much charity, it cannot be lived without much charity. And that is love. Love and not German philosophy that is the true explanation of this world, whatever may be the explanation of the next. And if you are ever in need of any help, lady children, come to me directly. If you ever want me, come to me for my assistance, and you shall have it. Come at once to me. Lord Goring, you're talking to me quite seriously. Why, I've never heard you talk seriously before. It won't happen again, if I can help it. <laughs> but I do like you to be serious. Dear Gertrude, don't say such a dreadful thing to Lord Goring. Seriousness would be very unbecoming to him. Good afternoon, Lord Goring. Pray be as trivial as you can. I should like to, but I'm uh, a little out of practice. And besides, it must be going. Just when I have come in, what dreadful manners you have. I'm sure you were very badly brought up. I was. <laughs> I wish I had brought you up. <laughs> I'm sorry you didn't. It is too late now, I suppose. <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> Will you come tomorrow morning? Yes, at 10. Don't forget. Of course I shan't. Oh, by the way, Lady Chiltern, there was no list of your guests in the morning posters of today. It's been a, apparently crowded out by the, the Lambeth Conference or the County Council or something equally as boring. But could I have a list of your guests? I, I do have a particular reason for wanting it. I'm sure Mr. Trafford would be glad to give you one. Thanks so much. Tommy is the most useful person in London. And who is the most ornamental? I am. <laughs> How clever of you to guess it. <laughs> we'll remember what I told you, won't you? Yes, but I'm not quite sure why you told it to me. I hardly know myself. Goodbye, Miss Mabel. I wish you were not going. I've had four wonderful adventures this morning. Four and a half, in fact. You might stop and listen to some of them. Four and a half? How very selfish of you to have four and a half. There won't be any left for me. <laughs> I don't want you to have any. They would not be good for you. That's the first unkind thing you've ever said to me. And how charmingly you said it. Until tomorrow. Sharp. Quite sharp. And don't bring Mr. Trafford. Of course I shan't bring Tommy Trafford. Tommy Trafford is in great disgrace. <laughs> Delighted to hear it. <laughs> Gertrude, I wish you would speak to Tommy Trafford. Uh, why, Mabel, what has poor Mr. Trafford done this time? Why, Robert says he's the best secretary we've ever had. Well, Tommy has proposed to me again. <laughs> Tommy really does nothing but propose to me. <laughs> he proposed to me last night in the music room. And I was quite unprotected as there was an elaborate trio going on. I didn't dare to make the smallest repartee, I need hardly tell you. If I had, it would have stopped the music at once. Musical people are so absurdly unreasonable. <laughs> they always want one to be perfectly dumb at the very moment when one is longing to be absolutely deaf. <laughs>
really interested in at present. <laughs> oh, Gertrude, do you know who's coming to see you? That dreadful Mrs. Cheveley in a most lovely gown. Did oh, you ask her? Mrs. Cheveley coming to see me? Impossible. I assure you she is coming upstairs, as large as life and not nearly so natural. <laughs> Why, I can assure you that the number of things I, my poor dear sister, 
they were taught not to understand was quite extraordinary. <laughs> but the modern woman understands everything, I'm told. Except her husband. That is one thing the modern woman never understands. And quite a good thing, too, dear. Might break up many a happy home if they did. Not yours, and we'd hardly say go to you. You have married a patent husband. I wish I could say the same for myself, but since Sir John has taken to attending the debates regularly, which he never used to do in the good old days, his language has become quite impossible. He always seems to think that he is addressing the house, and consequently, whenever he discusses the state of the agricultural laborer, or the Welsh church, or something very improper of that kind, I am always obliged to send all the servants out of the room. It is not pleasant to see one's own butler, who has been with one for 23 years, actually blushing at the sideboard, and the footmen making contortions in corners like persons in circuses. <laughs> Sir John is really a great trial. Why, this morning, before breakfast was half over, he stood up on the hearth rug, put his hands in his pockets, and appealed to the country at the top of his voice. I left the table as soon as I had had my second cup of tea, and he'd hardly say, but his violent language had heard all throughout the house. I trust, Gertrude, that Sir Robert is not like that. But I am very much interested in politics, Lady Markby. Why, I love to hear robbers talk about them. Well, I hope he is not as devoted to blue books as Sir John is. I don't think they can be quite improving reading for anyone. I've never read a blue book. I prefer books in yellow covers. Yellow is a gayer colour, is it not? I used to wear yellow a good deal in my younger days. And would you so still if Sir John were not so painfully personal on his observations? And a man on the subject of dress is always ridiculous, is he not? Oh, I think men are the only authority on dress. Really? One wouldn't say so from the sort of hats they wear, would one? <laughs> May I get you some tea, Mrs. Cheever? Thanks. Some tea, Lady Hartley. No, thanks, dear. The truth is that I have promised her around for ten minutes to see poor... Poor Lady Brancaster, who is in very great trouble. Her daughter, and a very well brought up girl too, has actually become engaged to be married to a curate in Shropshire. It is very sad, very sad indeed. I cannot understand this modern mania for curates. In my time, of course, we girls saw them running about the place like rabbits, but we never took any notice of them, I can hardly say. But nowadays, I hear that country society is quite honeycombed with them. I think most irreligious. And then the eldest son is called with his father, and it is said whenever they meet at the club, Lord Brancaster always hides himself behind the money articles in the Times. However, uh, I do not think that is quite <laughs> rare for us nowadays. And they are obliged to take an extra copy of the Times and all the clubs are paintings. <laughs> there are so many sons who don't have anything to do with their fathers. There are so many fathers who want to speak to their sons. I think myself it is very much regretted. Oh, I agree, Lady Markby. Fathers have so much to learn from their sons nowadays. Really, dear? What? The art of living, the only really fine art we have produced in modern society. Well, I'm afraid Lord Brancaster knew a good deal about that, more than his poor wife ever did. You know Lady Brancaster, don't you, dear? I do, slightly. She was staying at Langton last autumn when we were there. Well, like all stout women, she looks the very picture of happiness. I don't know if she noticed. But she has had many tragedies in her family, besides this affair of the curate. Her own sister, Mrs. Jekyll, led a most unhappy life, through no fault of her own, I'm sorry to say. In the end, she was so broken-hearted that she went into a convent, or onto the operatic stage. I forget which. <laughs> <laughs> no, I believe it was decorative art work that she took up. I know that she had lost all sense of pleasure in life. <coughs> and now, if you will allow me, I shall leave Mrs. Cheatley in your care and call back for her in a quarter of an hour. Or perhaps, dear Mrs. Cheatley, you wouldn't mind waiting in the carriage while I'm with Lady Brancaster. As I mean it to be a visit of condolence, I shan't stay long. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't mind waiting in the carriage, provided there is someone to look at one. Well, I hear that the curate is always prowling about the house. <laughs> well, I do hope Mrs. Cheatley will stay here a few minutes. Why, I would love to have a few minutes of conversation with her. Oh, I thank you, Lady Tilton. Believe me, nothing would give me great pleasure. Ah, no doubt you have very many pleasant references as you are school days to talk over together. <laughs> Public speaker. <laughs> Much more so than her husband. Though he is a typical. 
typical Englishman. Always darling, usually violent. Mrs. Cheveley, I think it right to tell you quite frankly that had I known who you really were, I should not have invited you to my house last night. Really? I could not have done so. I see you have not changed a bit, Gertrude. I never change. Then life has taught you nothing. It has taught me that a person who has once been guilty of a dishonest and dishonorable action may be guilty of it a second time and should be shunned. Would you apply the rule to everyone? Yes, to everyone, without exception. Then I'm sorry for you, Gertrude. Really sorry for you. You see now, I'm sure that for many reasons, any further acquaintance between us during your stay in London is quite impossible. Do you know, Gertrude, I don't mind your talking morality a bit to me. Morality is merely the attitude we adopt towards those people whom we personally dislike. You dislike me. I'm well aware of that, and I've always detested you. And yet I've come here today to render you a great service. Oh, a service? Like the service you wished to render my husband last night, I suppose. Why, thank heaven I saved him from that. It was you who made him write that insolent letter to me. It was you who made him break his promise. Yes. <laughs> then you must make him keep it. I will leave you tomorrow, if by that time your husband is not solemnly bind yourself to help me in this great scheme. This fraudulent speculation. Call it what you choose. I hold your husband in the hollow of my hand, and if you are wise, you will make him do what I tell him. You are impertinent. What has my husband to do with you? With a woman like you? In this world, like meets like. It is because your husband is himself fraudulent and dishonest that we pair so well together. Between you and he, there are chasms. He and I are closer than friends. We are enemies linked together. The same sin binds us. How dare you class my husband with yourself? How dare you threaten either him or me? Leave my house, you are unfit to enter Your this house, a house bought with the price of dishonor, a house everything in which was paid for by fraud. Ask him what the origin of his fortune is. Get him to tell you how he sold to a stockbroker a cabinet secret. Learn from him to what you owe your position. It is not true. Robert, tell her it is not true. Look at him. Can he deny it? Does he dare to? Go! Go at once! You have done your worst now! My worst? I have not finished with you, with either of you. I will give you both till tomorrow at noon. If by that time you do not do as I bid you, the whole world shall know the origin of Robert Chiltern. Show Mrs. Cheatley out. <laughs> you sold a cabinet secret for money. You began your life with fraud. You built up your career on dishonor. Lie to me, tell me it is not true. Lie to me. What this woman says is quite true. But Gertrude, listen to me. You don't realize how I was tempted. Let me tell you the whole thing. Don't come near me. Don't touch me. I feel as if you had soiled me forever. What a mask you've been wearing all these years, a horrible painted mask. You sold yourself for money. A common thief for better. You put yourself up for sale to the highest bidder. You were bought in the market. You lied to the whole world. And yet you will not lie to me. Gertrude! Gertrude! No, don't speak. Say nothing. Your voice wakes terrible memories. Memories of things that made me love you. Memories of words that made me love you. Memories that now are horrible to me. Now I worshipped you. You were to me something apart from common life. Something pure, noble, honest, without stain. The world seemed to be finer because you were in it. And goodness more real because you lived. And now, when I think that I made of a man like you my ideal, the ideal of my life. There was your mistake! There is your heir, the heir all women commit. Why can't you win the love is false and all? 
Why do you have to place us on monstrous pedestals? We have all feet of clay, women as well as men. But when we men love women, we love them knowing their faults, their weaknesses, their imperfections. I love them all the more it may be for that reason. It is not the perfect, but the imperfect who have need of love. It is when we are wounded, either by our own hands or the hands of others, that love should come to cure us. Else what use is love at all? Our lives, save loveless lives, true love should forgive. All sins, save a sin against itself. Love should pardon. Women think that they're making ideals of men. They're making false idols merely. You made your false idol out of me. But I had not the courage to come down. Show you my wounds. Tell you my weaknesses. I was afraid that I might lose your love. So I have lost it now. So last night you ruined my life for me. Yes, ruined it. What this woman asked of me was nothing compared to what she offered. She offered security, peace, stability. And the sin of my youth, which I had thought was buried, rose up in front of me, hideous, horrible, with its hands at my throat. I could have killed it, sent it back into its tomb, destroyed its record, burnt the one witness against me. But you prevented me. No one but you, you know it. Now it is left for me. A public disgrace, ruin, shame, the mockery of the world, a lonely, dishonored life, a lonely, dishonored death that may be someday. Let women make no more ideals of men. Let them not set them on altars and bow before them. Or they may ruin other lives as completely as you. You whom I have so wildly loved, I prove it mine. That will do. Hmm. Brother, curious? 
Lady Chiltern's handwriting on Lady Chiltern's pink note paper. The book was to write. I want you. I trust you. I'm coming to you. Gertrude. I want you. It's you. So she's found out everything. The poor woman. Poor, poor woman. <coughs> What's an hour to call? Nearly ten. Uh, I have to give up going to the Berkshires. Although it's always nice to be expected and not to arrive. <laughs> not expected at the bachelor's, so I shall certainly go there. Well, uh, make her stand by her husband. It's the only thing for her to do. Ten o'clock, she shall be here soon. Must sell fifth time not into anyone else. A Lord Caversham. <coughs> Why do parents always arrive at the wrong time? <laughs> Delighted to see you, Father. Look off. Is it worthwhile, Father? Of course it is worthwhile, sir. Which is the most comfortable chair? That one, Father. <laughs> Thank you. No draft, I hope, in this room? No, Father. Glad to hear it. Can't stand drafts. No drafts at all. Good many breezes, Father. Eh? Eh? Can't understand you, sir. Want to have a serious conversation with you, sir. My dear father, it's at this hour. It is only ten o'clock, sir. What is your objection to the hour? Well, I think the hour is an admirable hour. Well, the <coughs> fact is, father, that this is not my day for talking seriously. Uh, I'm very sorry, but it's simply not my day. <laughs> what do you mean, sir? During the season, father, I only talk seriously on the first Tuesday of every month from four to seven. <laughs> <laughs> Tuesday, sir, make it Tuesday. But, but it is after <coughs> seven, Father, and the doctor says I must not have any serious conversation after seven. It, it makes me talk in my sleep. <laughs> talk in your sleep, sir? What does that matter? You are not married. <laughs> no, Father, I am not married. <laughs> that is what I have come to talk to you about. You have to get married, sir, and at once. Why, at your age? I had been a consulate widower for three months and was already paying my addresses to your admirable mother. <laughs> Can't be always living for pleasure, sir. Every man in position is married nowadays. Bachelors are not fashionable anymore. They're a damaged lot. Too much is known about them. You must get a wife, sir. Look where your friend Robert Chilton has got you by probity, hard work, and a sensible marriage to a good woman. Why don't you imitate him, sir? Why don't you take him for your model? I think I shall, Father. I wish you would, sir. Then I should be happy. <coughs> At present, I make your mother's life miserable on your account. You are heartless, sir. Quite heartless. Oh, I hope not, Father. And it is high time for you to get married. You are 34 years of age, sir. But I only admit to 32. <laughs> 31 and a half when I have a really good buttonhole. <laughs> this buttonhole isn't, isn't trivial enough. I tell you, you are 34, sir. And there's a draft in your room besides, which makes your conduct worse. I tell you, there's a draft, sir. I feel it. I feel it distinct. So do I, Father. It's a, it's a dreadful draft. I will come and see you tomorrow, Father. We can talk over anything you like. Uh, no, sir. I have come tonight for a definite purpose, and I intend to see it through at all costs in my health court. <laughs> sure. Put down my cloak, sir. <laughs> Certainly, Father, but... Let us go into another room. There is a dreadful draft in here. Uh, is there a good fire in the smoking room? Yes, my lord. Uh, my dear father, let us go into there. Your, your seizures are quite heart rending. Well, I suppose I'd like to sneeze when I choose. Uh, quite so, father. I was uh, merely expressing sympathy. No. Hang sympathy. There's a great deal too much of that sort of thing going around nowadays. I quite agree with you, father. If there was less sympathy in the world, there'd be less trouble in it. That is a paradox, sir. I hate paradox. <laughs> so do I, Father. Everyone one meets nowadays is paradox. This great bore makes society so obvious. You always quite understand everything you say, sir. Uh, yes, Father, if I listen attentively. <laughs> listen attentively, conceited young puppy. Pips, there's a lady coming to see me on particular business. Show her into the drawing room, 
she arrives, you understand? Yes, my lord. Uh, it is a matter of gravest importance, Phipps. I understand, my lord. <laughs> no one else is to be admitted under any circumstances. I understand, my lord. <laughs> that is probably the lady. I shall see her myself. Well, sir, I'm going to wait in attendance on you. <laughs> in a moment, father. Sure, and you remember my instructions. Is Lord Goring not at home? His lordship told me to ask you, madam, to be kind enough to wait in the drawing room for him. His lordship will come to you there. Lord Goring expects me? Yes, madam. Are you quite sure? His lordship told me that if a lady called, I was to ask her into the drawing room. His lordship's directions on the subject were very precise. <laughs> How thoughtful of him. To expect the unexpected is a thoroughly modern intellect. Ugh. How dreary about the drawing room always looks. I shall have to change all this. No, I don't care for that lamp. It's far too glaring. Lights and candles. Certainly, madam. I hope the candles have very becoming shades. We have had no complaints about them, madam. <laughs> As yet. What good woman he is waiting for tonight. Delightful protection. Men always look so silly when they are caught. They are always being caught. What a very interesting room. What a very interesting picture. What does correspondence look like? Very uninteresting correspondence. Bills and cards, debts and dowagers. What on earth writes him on pink note paper? How silly to write on pink note paper. It looks like the beginning of a middle class romance. Romance should never be in the sentiment. It should be in the science and end of the settlement. I know that handwriting. That is Gertrude Children's. I remember it perfectly. The moral law all over the page and the Ten Commandments in every stroke of the pen. What is she been writing to him about? Something hard about me, I shouldn't wonder. How I detest that woman. I want you. I trust you. I'm coming to you. <laughs> Gertrude. I want you. I trust you. I'm coming to you. The candles in the drawing room are lit, madam, as you directed. Thanks. I trust the shades will be to your liking. They're the most becoming we have. <laughs> they are the same as his lordship uses himself when he is dressing for dinner. Then I'm sure they will be perfectly right. Thank you, madam. Anyone else? 
Even my father had a comparatively cold reception, complained to the draft the entire time. Ah, <laughs> uh, you must be at home to me, Arthur. You are my best friend. Perhaps by tomorrow, you will be my only friend. My wife has discovered everything. Uh, I guessed as much. Really? How? Merely by something in the expression of your face as you came in. <coughs> Who told her? <coughs> Mrs. Cheevey herself. Now the woman I love knows that I began my career on an act of low dishonesty, that I built up my life on sands of shame, and that I sold, like a common huckster, the one secret that had been entrusted to me as a man of honor. I thank God poor Lord Bradley died without knowing I had betrayed him. I would to God that I had died before I had been so horribly tempted or fallen so low. You've heard nothing yet in, in, from Vienna in answer to your wire? Yes. I received a telegram from the First Secretary <coughs> at 8 o'clock tonight. Well? Nothing is absolutely known against her. On the contrary, she holds a rather high position in society. It is a sort of open secret that Baron Arnheim left to her the greater portion of his immense fortune. Beyond that, I can learn nothing. She doesn't turn out to be a spy, then. Spies are of no use to us. Their profession is over. The newspapers do their jobs. <coughs> and thunderingly well they do it. <laughs> Arthur, I am not arch the thirst. May I ring for something? Uh, certainly. Allow me. Uh, Hawk and seltzer. <coughs> Thank you, Arthur. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You are my only friend. What a friend you are. The only friend I can trust. I can trust you absolutely, can't I? Oh, of course. Uh, some hot consults are Phipps. Yes, my lord. Oh, and Phipps, you do excuse us for a moment. I, I do need to give some, some instruction to my servant. <laughs> when that lady arrives, uh, tell her I'm, I'm not at home. Tell her that I'm uh, suddenly being expected out of town or something. The lady is in that room, my lord. <laughs> you told me to show her into that room, my lord. You did perfectly right. <laughs> oh, what a mess I am in. <laughs> no, 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 I shall get through it. I shall give her a, a, a lunch through the door or something. Awkward to manage, though. <laughs> Arthur, tell me what I should do. My whole life seems to have crumbled around me. I am a ship without a rudder, and a knight without a star. You love your wife. Don't you? I love my wife more than anything in the world. I used to think ambition the great thing. It is not. Love is the greatest thing in the world. And I love her. But I am ignoble in her eyes. I am defamed in her eyes. And there is a wide gulf between us now. She has found me out, Arthur. She has found me out. Has she never in her life done, done some folly, some indiscretion that she may not forgive your sin? My wife? Never. She does not know what weakness or temptation is. I am a play like other men. But she stands apart as good women do. Pitiless in her perfection. Cold and stern without mercy. But I love her, Arthur. We are childless. And I have no one else to love. No one else to love me. Perhaps if God had sent us children, she might have been kinder to me. God has given us a lonely house. She has cut my heart in two. But don't let us talk of that. I was brutal to her this evening. But I suppose when sinners talk to saints, they are brutal always. I said to her things hideously true. From my side, from my standpoint, from the standpoint of men. But don't let us talk of that. Your wife will forgive you. Perhaps at this very moment she is forgiving you. She loves you, Robert. Why should she not forgive? God grant it. God grant it! <coughs> but Arthur, there is something else I need to tell you. Hawk and Seltzer, sir. Thank you. Uh, did you bring your carriage? <coughs> no, I, I walked from the club. Uh, Sir Robert will take my cap, Fitz. Yes, my lord. <coughs> you don't mind me sending you away. Arthur, you must let me stay for five minutes. I made up my mind what I'm going to do in the house tonight. The debate on the Argentine Canal begins at 11. 
What was that? Nothing. I heard a chair fall over the next room. Someone has been listening. No, 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 there is no one there. There is someone there. There are lights in the room. The door is ajar. Someone has been listening to every secret of my life. Arthur, tell me what this means. Robert, you are excited, unnerved. I tell you there is no one in that room. Break, sit down, Robert. You give me your word there is no one there. Yes. Your word of honor. Yes. <laughs> Arthur, you must let me see for myself. No. <laughs> Why should I not go into that room? Arthur, let me look into that room and satisfy myself. Let me know that no one has learned my life secret. Arthur, you don't realize what I'm going through. Robert, I've told you there is no one in that room. That is enough. It is not enough. I insist on going into this room. You have said there is no one there. What reason have you for refusing me? For God's sake, don't! There was someone in that room. Some in whom you must not see. I thought so. I forbid you to enter that room. Stand back. My life is at stake, and I don't care who is in there. I will know to whom I have told my secret and my shame. Great heavens, his own wife! <laughs> what explanation have you for the presence of that woman here? Go to the point my word of honor, that woman is stainless and guiltless of all of it. <laughs> Well, you were, silly Arthur. My Lord Mortlake doesn't offer anything more to me than an amusement. 
one of those utterly tedious amusements one finds at an English country house on an English country Sunday. I don't think anyone at all morally responsible for what he or she does at an English country house. Yes, I know lots of people think that. I loved you, Arthur. My dear Mrs. Cheatley, you've always been far too clever to know anything about love. I did love you, and you loved me. You know you loved me. And love is a very wonderful thing. I suppose that when a man has loved a woman, he will do anything for her except continue to love her? Yes, except that. I'm tired of living abroad. I want to come back to London. I want to have a charming house here. I want to have a salon. If one could only teach the English how to speak and the Irish how to listen, society here would be quite civilized. <laughs> Besides, I've arrived at the romantic stage. When I saw you last night at the Chilterns, I knew you were the only person I'd ever cared for. If I'd ever, ever cared for anyone, Arthur. And so, on the morning of the day you marry me, I will give you Robert Chilterns' letter. That is my offer. I'll give it to you now, if you promise to marry me. Now? Tomorrow. Are you really serious? Quite serious. I should make for you a very bad husband. Oh, I don't mind. I've had two. They amuse me immensely. <laughs> you mean you amuse yourself immensely? <coughs> what do you know about my married life? Nothing, but I can read it like a book. What book? The book of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> In the case of very fascinating women, that is a challenge, not an offense. I suppose that is meant for a compliment, <coughs> my dear Arthur. Women are never disarmed by compliments. Men always are. That's the difference between the two. Women are never disarmed by anything, as far as I know them. Then you're going to allow your gracious friend, Robert Chilton, to be ruined rather than marry someone who really has considerable attractions left. I thought you would rise to some great height of self-sacrifice, Arthur. I think you should. And then the rest of your life could be spent in contemplating your own perfection. So why do that as it is? And self-sacrifice is a thing that should be put down by law. It is so demoralizing that people one self-sacrifices oneself. They always go to the bad. As if anything to demoralize Robert Chilton. You forget. I know his real character. What you know is not his real character, but an act of folly done in his youth. Dishonorable, I admit. Shameful, I admit. Unworthy of him, I admit. And therefore, not his true character. How you men stand up for one another. How you women war against each other. I only war against one woman, against Gertrude Chilter. I hate her. I hate her now more than ever. Because you have brought a real tragedy in her life, I oh, suppose. There is only one tragedy in a woman's life. The fact that her past is always her lover, and her future invariably her husband. Well, Lady Chilter knows nothing of the type of life which you are alluding. A woman whose size and gloves is seven and three quarters never knows much about anything. You know, of course, that Gertrude has always worn seven and three quarters. That is why there was never any moral sympathy between them. <coughs> well, Arthur, I suppose this romantic interview may be regarded as it meant. You admit it was romantic, don't you? For the privilege of being your wife, I was ready to surrender a great prize, the climax of my diplomatic career. You refuse. Very well. If our children does not uphold my Argentine scheme, I expose him. Voila, too. You mustn't do that! It would be vile, horrible, infamous! Oh, don't use such big words. They mean so little. It's a commercial transaction, that's all. There's no use mixing sentimentality into it. I offer to sell Robert Children a certain thing. If you will not pay my price, you will have to pay the world a greater one. That is all that is to be said. I must go. Goodbye. Won't you shake hands? With you? Never. Your transaction with Robert Chilton may pass as a loathsome commercial transaction of a loathsome commercial age, but you seem to have forgotten that you came here tonight to talk of love. You whose love desecrate the word love. You to whom the thing is a book closely sealed. Went this afternoon to the house of one of the most noble and gentle women in all of England to degrade her husband in her eyes, to try and kill her love for him, to put poison in her heart and bitterness in her life, to break her idol as it may be, spoil her soul. That. That I cannot forgive. That was horrible. For that, for that there can be no forgiveness. Arthur, you were just to me. Believe me, you were quite unjust to me. I think it would taunt Gertrude at all. I called with Lady Marshall merely to find whether an ornament, a jewel that I lost somewhere, had been found at the children's. If you don't believe me, you can ask Lady Marshall. She would tell you it is true. The scene that occurred afterwards, 
was really forced on me by Gertrude's rudeness and sneers. I called, oh, a little out of mouth, if you like, but really to see whether a roach of mine had been found. That was the origin of the whole affair. A diamond snake brooch. Yes, how did you know? Because it is found. In point of fact, I found it myself and stupidly forgot to tell the butler anything about it as I was, as I was leaving. Oh. <laughs> is this it? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad to have it back. It was oh, a present. Won't you wear it? Certainly. If you will pin it on me. Why do you put on us a bracelet? I didn't know it could be worn as a bracelet. Really? No. It looks very well on me as a bracelet, don't you think? Yes, much better than when I saw it last. When did you see it last? On my cousin Mary Berkshire, from whom you stole it. What do you mean? I mean that you stole that tournament from my cousin Mary Berkshire, to whom I gave it when she was married. Suspicion fell on a wretched servant who was sent away in disgrace. I found it last night, and I determined to say nothing about it until I found the thief. I have found the thief now and heard her own confession. It's not true. You know it's true. Why, the thief is written across your face at this very moment. I'll deny the whole thing from beginning to end. I'll say I've never seen this wretched thing that was never in my possession. The drawback of stealing a thing, Mrs. Cheveley, is that one never knows how wonderful that the thing that one steals is. You can't take that bracelet off unless you know where the spring is. And I see you don't know where the spring is. It's rather difficult to find. <laughs> you brute! You coward! Oh, don't use such big words. You mean so little. <laughs> for my servant. He's an admirable servant. Always comes when one rings for him. <laughs> he comes. I'm going to call for the police. The police? What for? Tomorrow the Berkshires will prosecute you. That is what the police are for. Don't do that. I will do anything you want. Anything in the world you want. Give me Robert Chiltern's letter. Stop. Stop. Let me have time to think. Give me Robert Chiltern's letter. I have letter. not got it with me. I will give it to you tomorrow. No, you've got to with you now. <laughs>
patients. Can't find anyone in this house to talk to. And I'm full of interesting information. <laughs> I feel like the latest edition of something or other. Sir Robert is still at the foreign office, my lord. Uh, Lady Chilton's not down yet. Her uh, ladyship has not yet left her room. Miss Chilton has just come in from Ryan. Ah, that is something. Lord Caversham has been waiting some time in the library for Sir Robert. I told him your lordship was here. <coughs> Thank you. Would you kindly tell him that I've left? I shall do so, my lord. <laughs> really, I don't want to meet my father three days running. <laughs> There's a great deal too much excitement for any son. <laughs> Hope to goodness he won't come up. Fathers should be neither seen nor heard. <laughs> that is the only proper basis of family life. Mothers are different. Mothers are darlings. <laughs>
if I had, I know what I would make him do. <laughs> Some good news 
say it's how you feel. Mrs. Cheeveley gave me up Robert's letter last night, and, and I burned it. I nearly burned myself. <laughs>
Mrs. Cheatley has handed over to Lord Grain the document that was in her possession, and he has destroyed it. Are you sure of this? Why, yes. Lord Grain has just told me. Then I am safe. <laughs> oh, and what a thing it is to be safe. For these two days now, I have been in terror. But I am safe now. How did Arthur destroy my letter? He burned it. <laughs> Nearly burned himself. <laughs> I wish I had been there. <laughs> See that one sin of my youth burning in ashes? How many men in modern life would love to see their past burning the white ashes before them? Is Arthur still here? Yes, he's in the conservatory. <laughs> I'm so glad now that I gave that speech in the house last night. I'm so glad. I gave it, I gave it thinking that disgrace might be the result. But it has not been so. Public honor has been the result. I think so. I fear so almost. For though I have escaped all detection, for though every proof against me has been destroyed, I suppose, Gertrude, I suppose that I should retire from public life. Oh, yes, Robert, you should do that. It is your duty to do that. It would be much to surrender. No, it would be much to gain. And you would be happy. And living alone with me, abroad perhaps, or in the country, away from London, away from public life, you, you would have no regrets. Oh, none, Robert. And you're ambitious for me. You used to be ambitious for me. Oh, my ambition. I have none now, but that we two may love each other. It was your ambition that first led you astray. Let us not talk about ambition any longer. <laughs> Arthur, I have to thank you for what you've done for me. I don't know how I can repay you. I'll tell you at once. At the present moment, under the usual palm tree. I'm in the conservatory. Lord Camish. Congratulations to you, children, on your brilliant speech last night. I have just come from the Prime Minister, and you are to have the vacant seat in the Cabinet. A seat in the Cabinet? Mm, yes. Here is the Prime Minister's letter. A seat in the Cabinet? Certainly. And you well deserve it, too. You've got just what we want so much in political life nowadays. High character, high moral tone, high principles. Hmm. Just what you would not, but, sir. Never <laughs> would have. I don't like principles, Father. I prefer prejudices. <laughs> I cannot accept this offer, Lord Cavisham. I have made up my mind to decline it. Decline it, sir? Yes. It is my intention to retire from public life immediately. Decline a seat in the cabinet and retire from public life? Never heard such absurd nonsense in the whole course of my existence. Uh, lady children, if you are a sensible woman, the most sensible woman in London, the most sensible woman I know. <coughs> I am prevent your husband from making such a, from taking such a. Are you kind to do that, lady children? <laughs> I think my husband is right in his decision, Lord Caversham, and I approve of it. You approve of it? Good heavens! <laughs> I admire him for it. I admire him immensely for it. I have never admired him so much before. Why, he is finer than even I thought him. You will go and write your letter to the Prime Minister, won't you, Robert? Don't hesitate about it. I suppose I should write it at once. Such offers are not repeated. You will excuse me for a moment, Lord Caversham. I may go with you, may I not, Robert? Yes, Richard. <laughs> What's the matter with this family? <laughs> Have we wrong here, eh? Did you see? Hmm. Predatoriat. Both of them, too, wife as well as husband. Can't understand it. They're not an old family. Very sad, very sad indeed. It is 
not idiocy, Father, I assure you. <laughs> well, what is it then, sir? It is what is called nowadays is a high moral tone, and that is all. Hate these newfangled things, sir. Same things we used to call idiocy 50 years ago. You <laughs> can't stay in this house any longer. No, no, do go in here for a moment, Father. What, third be a palm tree on the left, the, the usual palm tree. What? <laughs> I beg your pardon, Father. Uh, the conservatory. Uh, there is someone I should like you to talk to. Uh, about what, sir? <coughs> about me, Father. <laughs> Not a subject on which much eloquence is possible. <laughs> no, Father, but the lady is like me. She thinks eloquence a little loud. Lady Chiltern. Lady Chiltern. Why are you playing Mrs. Cheveley's cards? I don't understand you. Mrs. Cheveley made an attempt to ruin your husband. Either by driving him from public life or by making him adopt a dishonorable position. From the latter tragedy, you have saved him. The former, you're now thrusting upon him. Why should you do him the wrong that Mrs. Cheveley tried to do and failed? Lord Goring. Lady Chiltern, allow me. You wrote me a letter last night in which you said that you trusted me and wanted my help. Now is the moment you really want my help. Now is the time you've got to trust me. To trust in my counsel and in my judgment. You love your husband. Do you want to kill his love for you? What sort of existence would he have if you robbed him of the fruits of his ambition? If you took from him the splendor of a great political career? If you closed the doors of public life against him? If you condemned him to a sterile failure he who is meant for triumph, for triumph and success. A woman is not meant to judge her husband, but to forgive where he needs forgiveness. Pardon, pardon not punishment is remission. Why should you scourge him with rods for, for a sin done in his youth? Before he knew you, Lady Chiltern, before he knew even himself. Don't make any terrible mistake, Lady Chiltern. If you can keep his love, and love him in return, you've done all the world wants of us, or should want. But it is my husband himself who wishes to retire from public life. Why, it was he who first said so. But rather than lose your love, Robert would do anything, wreck his whole career as he is on the brink of doing now. He's making for you a terrible sacrifice, Lady Chiltern. Take my advice. Do not accept a sacrifice so great. If you do so, you will live to repent it bitterly. We men and women are not meant to, to accept such great sacrifices from each other. We are not worthy of them. Besides, Robert has been punished enough. We have both been punished. I set him up too high. Do not for that same reason set him down now too low. If Robert has fallen from his altar, do not thrust him into the mire. Failure to Robert would be the very mire of shame. Power is his passion. Robert would lose everything, even his power to feel love. Your husband's love is at this moment in your hands. Your husband's life is at this moment in your hands. Don't walk both for him. Here's the draft of my letter, Gertrude. Shall I read it to you? Let me see it. What are you doing? We have both been wrong, and we have both been punished for it. Why should I punish you any more? I have just learned this and much more from Lord Goring, and I will not spoil your life for you. Nor will I see you spoil it as a sacrifice for me, a useless sacrifice. Gertrude, Gertrude. You can forget. Men easily forget. <laughs> but I can forgive. My wife. Arthur, it seems that I am going to be continually in your debt. Your debt is the Lady Chelter, not to me. I owe you much. And now tell me, what were you going to ask me just now as Lord Caversham came in? Robert, you are your sister's guardian. 
and I want your consent to my marriage with her. That is all. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. My sister to be your wife. Yes. I am very sorry, Arthur, but the thing is quite impossible. I have to think about Mabel's future happiness, and I do not think her happiness would be safe in your hands. And I cannot have that sacrifice. Sacrificed? Yes, utterly sacrificed. Loveless marriages are horrible things. But there is one thing worse than an absolutely loveless marriage, Arthur. A marriage in which there is love, but on one side only. Faith, but on one side only. Devotion, but on one side only. And in which of the two hearts, one is sure to be broken. But I love Mabel. No other woman has any place in my life. Why, Robert, if they love each other, why should they not be married? Arthur cannot give Mabel the love that she deserves. What reason do you have for saying this? Do you really require me to tell you? Certainly I do. As you choose. <laughs> <laughs> when I called upon you yesterday evening, I found Mrs. Cheveley concealed in one of your rooms. <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night. I wish to say nothing more. Your relations with Mrs. Cheveley have, as I said to you last night, nothing whatsoever to do with me. I know that you were engaged to be married to her at one time. The fascination she held over you then seems to have returned. You spoke of her last night as a woman pure and stainless. <laughs> and respected. That may be so, but I cannot give my sister's life into your hands. It would be wrong of me, Arthur. It would be unjust, infamously unjust to her. I have nothing more to say. Robert, it was not Mrs. Cheveley whom Lord Goring accepted last night. Not time. Mrs. Cheveley? Who was it? It was, it, me. it was your own wife. <laughs> told me that if I was ever in trouble, then I could write to him and come to him for help and advice. And so, last night, after we had that terrible scene in this room, I did write to him, telling him that, that I wanted him, and that I trusted him, and... <laughs> <laughs> yes, that same letter. <laughs> but I didn't go to Lord Goines after all. I, I felt it was from ourselves alone that help can come. My pride made me think that. But Mrs. Cheveley went. She stole my letter and sent it to you anonymously this morning that you should think. Oh, Robert, I cannot tell you what she wished you to think. What? Had I fallen so low in your eyes that you thought that even for a moment I could doubt your goodness? Gertrude! <laughs> you are to me the white image of every good thing. Sin could never touch you. Arthur, you may go to Mabel. <laughs> Luncheon is on the table, my lady. 
You'll stop to luncheon, won't you, Lord Caversham? Yeah, with pleasure. And I'll drive you to Downing Street afterwards, children. You have a great future before you. A great future. I wish I could say the same for you, sir. <laughs> but your career will have to be entirely domestic. <laughs> yes, Father, I, I prefer domestic. <laughs> and if you don't make this young lady an ideal husband, I'll cut you off with a shilling. An ideal husband? Oh, I don't think I should like that. It sounds like something from the next world. <laughs> well, what do you want him to be then, dear? He can be what he chooses. All I want is to be, to be a real wife to him. On my word, there's a good deal of common sense in that. <laughs> Your servant had told me you were not at home. How extraordinary. Well, uh, 
fact is, Father, excuse me. <laughs> handwriting on Lady Chiltern's pink notepaper. The book was to write. Hmm. I want you. I trust you. Robert! Robert, do come out here for a second. Robert, I do know you want to look pretty, but you don't have to look that pretty. <laughs> My dear Robert, you look very nice. This is it? Yes. This is it? Yes. <laughs> Don't want to burn down the desk. Must 
admit, it was fun, don't you? <laughs> I enjoyed acting with you, though you did not adore me. <laughs> and you, while not quite the ideal husband, <laughs> were a real friend. And a true American. <laughs> must divorce their husbands. They are brutal always. But I have come to render you one last service. I have written you a song. Divorces seem to go well with music, don't they? The song I dedicate to you, Robert, to you and no one else. <laughs> Gertrude. <laughs>